but never in Hawaii because I had this living belief that nobody would fly out to Hawaii to see me. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out, and then he became one of the man. Okay, it is January 2020, and this is the monthly market update. If you guys have not heard of me before, I have Simple Passive Cash Flow Podcast, where it's all about passive investing in real estate and potentially other non-real estate items as we get deeper and deeper into the market cycle. So the first is a collection of different news articles that I've gotten, but I do this every year. For those who aren't familiar with what's shown here, this is the Google keywords. You can look at keywords in Google and look up different trends and you can see how the world is, what they're searching for um, throughout the different times. So I'll, I'll go in here and I'll screw around. I'll put in uh, the word recession. And obviously in the year 2008, everybody was searching for it and it's been nothing so far except there was some kind of blurb here recently. I don't know what that's all about. But then, you know, you compare it to other words like I put in, in blue here, retirement, investing and recession. Seems like people are starting to get back on the investing bandwagon after 2010. So, uh, you know, a lot of you guys are looking for turnkey rentals or even single family homes in general, man, it's just so competitive out there. Retirement's kind of been steady. I was in uh, San Diego the other month and um, a guy from John Burns gave a speech on market conditions. There are a lot of good slides in here. I just took this one to add in the presentation. Where do we expect the growth to be the strongest? Well, it's all the southern states, and this is what I've mentioned before, that you draw a nice little smiley face in the um, United States. I think the furthest I had properties was Pennsylvania and Indianapolis, but I since sold those properties. Now my most northern property is up in Des Moines, and yeah, it's a pain in the butt. You got all this pipes breaking. And, um, you know, the trends are all, everybody's moving to the South. Maybe it has something to do with people getting older and they want to retire. But I believe at certain markets, you're looking at job growth in the Southern states for a lot of blue collar jobs. And I think that's what's driving a lot of the Southern growth to certain markets. So a commercial headline here, Florida's first LGBTQ senior housing breaks ground. Kind of interesting. You know, I don't want to just get political or, or get people upset, anything like here. But so like, you know, like senior housing, it is what it is. They say like seniors like to live in clusters with their own racial um, similarity people. So it's just, it's interesting how these things develop like this. Some Huntsville news here and some Arkansas news here. A couple secondary tertiary markets that are really starting to get on the radar. And um, I think gone are the days where you can just wait for deals coming from Memphis, Kansas City, Indianapolis, you know, all the perennial uh, turnkey markets that have been pushed for almost a decade now. You've got to go, you've got to go and uncover some higher hanging fruit these days. So uh, Redstone Arsenal is in Huntsville. They're growing to 50,000 workers by 2025. New plants, a new A-class development there. And Springfield, Arkansas, they just leased to BNSF Logistics, a company that I'm very familiar with. This is the railroad company. Railroads are known to be leading indicators for the economy. At least that's how it was for when you were coming out of the recession in 2010 to 2012. They're the ones who are, are hauling a lot of the, the raw materials, the lumber, a lot of the chemicals to, to industries to then process and make the final product. Top markets for multifamily rent growth from multi-housing news. Look at that, Huntsville, Alabama. And I'm a little upset because I don't want anybody to know about Little Huntsville. This is probably the first months I've ever seen it on Crack This List. Las Vegas has been there, but we all know, kind of stay away from Las Vegas because it's a very cyclical market. Pensacola. Cola was number one, Phoenix was number two, Huntsville was number three, Las Vegas num number four, and five was Portland, Maine. And that 
is for percent change year-over-year year growth. So some news that we've been following on the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac saga. In past news, Fannie Mae Freddie Mac, they become sort of public entities after the Great Recession of 2018. They kind of collapsed, government stepped in, and there's, there's talks about them going back to private organizations. Some articles here, and we'll have all this in, you know, if you guys go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash investor letter, all these articles and links are found there if you would like to share that with other people. Maybe you have a person who is not completely on board with investing. So Freddie Mac says here that they expect the housing market in 2020 and beyond. The GSE also expects home prices growth to slow over the next few years with annual growth rates of 3.2%, 2.9% and 2.1% respectively from 2019 to 2021 respectively. Still growth, but I think that everybody's in agreement that things are kind of slowing down, but still moving forward. But definitely the gone are the days of the 4 to 7% increases. Another article at the end of Fannie Mae Freddie conservation shipped by 2022. So they're saying that if all goes well, 2021, 2022, we'll see a very large public offering of these companies. And what does that mean? Well, I think most investors will get freaked out because, oh my God, I can't find a Fannie Mae Freddie Mac loan for my properties anymore. I wouldn't worry about it. There's always going to be some other way. And then this is the government. I'd be surprised if anything even happens by 2023. This has also happened, I think, earlier this year for our deals. We were talking to our direct Fannie lender and they said, and this is in the summertime, that they had hit their annual quarter or quota for 2019 and they weren't going to be lending it anymore. But they had a meeting of the minds and then a couple of weeks later, they get it all figured out and then they just move some things around and then they, they open up the floodgates again. Next article here on a year over year basis, the September starts of buildings with five or more units were 5.8% below September 2018. These two charts are showing the rents being pretty stable between a 2% to 4.3% rent increase and in relation to the CPI. And then on the right side here is a chart of the multifamily starts. And what that is, is new inventory coming online, typically class A builds that are being built. It's usually ranging in 300,000 to 450,000 this last calendar year. U.S. job gains surprisingly solid in October, says RealPage. And this comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So unemployment has gone down from almost 10% to now a little under 4%. It's almost like a straight line, steadily going down. I mean, everybody's working out there, it seems like. Monthly change in employment definitely fluctuates. But I think the that orange line shows the story right there. All-time lows in unemployment now. Well, I don't know if all-time, but been the lowest since about a decade. Another interesting market that I've been kind of looking at lately is is Phoenix, Arizona. This article here, Phoenix Multifamily Report, is showing the Metro's sustained economic performance and demographic expansion continue to be reflected in its multifamily market. I'm watching it. It's a hot market, and it typically is. If you look back at the last correction and growth cycle, it's growing a lot now, but I don't know. I mean, me personally, it, it's very intriguing, but it, yeah, it's, it also fell a lot in the recession too. But I think, I think it would work if you bought like a smaller multifamily family in a higher price area like an Arcadia submarket is super solid, A class. But if you push like a C class up to B, of course that sounds good in theory. What sounds good in theory isn't really foundable out there. It's very rare. But I think that would be a cool way to ride this wave. So the Yardi Matrix report is a pretty good news source for real estate and commercial real estate. Some of their takeaways is that the US economy is a glass half full, glass half empty situation where the GDP growth in quarter three was okay at 1.9% and we expect Q4 to be a little lower. US oil production is keeping inflation low below 2%. The yield curve, which has inverted, been inverted for five months now. And what we're talking about is that people talk about the yield curve of when the 10-year curve inverted, and that was supposed to be marking the end of humanity. 
and the markets as we know it. But we're all still here saying it's flattened following the September 18th and October 30th rate cuts. The European and Chinese economies are still in poor shape. The US service sector labor market is extremely tight and wages continue to rise. Manufacturing and farm sectors are struggling. There is a highly elevated risk of recession mid 2021, which that's their opinion. I'm reading other news sources that are not free that don't say that. But again, I think it's good to go into deals with cash flow in mind. Just don't get caught with your pants down. Is kind of the same. Yardi continues to say here, demographic and lifestyle changes are fueling strong demand for multifamily due to aging population, increasing divorce rates, and more younger people living at home contribute to small demand. And overall, housing production is unlikely to catch up with household formation. And this is what keeps putting upward pressure on rents and occupancy. And I think this is why you're seeing pressure for rent control, a lot of the California type of markets. And it continues to talk about some more political risk. More from Yardi, they came out and it's a, just another graph here of GDP growth. It's been pretty much positive for a decade. Consumer confident index, I don't know how they measure that, but right now it's at all time highs for the last two decades. And the Atlanta Fed GDP Q4 2019 forecast was 1.1. So they also brought this interesting thought about inflation. Why is there no inflation? And they're saying the US oil is flooding the market now. I only recently started to check oil. I, I did an oil and gas deal by myself in the last year. So now I'm actually know what the what the price of oil was before i didn't really care but now i'm kind of starting to pay attention to it and and that's i think that's indicative of like learning right like if you wanted to learn bitcoin go put in 500 bucks and you'll start to pay attention to it so i think what what they're saying here is why isn't inflation going up well the u.s oil supply is kind of coming into the market and i think that's what's kind of i, I don't know if I, i'm saying it right but maybe it's a cheaper support for oil for those of you guys doing airbnb and short-term rentals i do have a simple passive cash flow facebook group just for that but i'm not a big fan of doing this short-term rental stuff another bad news headline here airbnb is banning all open invite parties and events says Newsweek. Hosts who attempt to circumvent this ban and allow guests to throw large parties will be subject to consequences. Now, I thought this was a great idea about five, 10 years ago, right? If you're pretty frugal and you want to downsize or have a small apartment and you want to have friends over, what do you do? You get a cool big Airbnb and you, and you trash the place there or you have everybody come over there. But apparently Airbnb bounce upon that. Five markets with the greatest rent loss. So you don't want to be on this list. Number one, Midland Odessa. They had a percent change of negative 4%. Number two, Honolulu, Hawaii. Gee, I wonder where that is. It's, and that's kind of funny because we don't really have, Hawaii doesn't really have seasons out here. Uh, number three, Baton Rouge. Number four, Scranton. Number five, Lafayette, like Charles. I'm in some deals in like Charles. So that one's kind of alarming to me. So a lot of you guys sent me this article and I thought I'd put it in here because since you guys were interested in it, me, I didn't really care. Number one, it still has to go through a lot of voting. But so the SEC is proposing to update a credit investor definition to increase access for investments. So I, my interpretation, what they're doing is they're adding this term sophisticated or accredited for accredited investors. You can sort of test your way into being accredited by doing like a series six or seven. Um, they haven't figured it out yet, nor have they approved this. But for those investors who are sophisticated and maybe like half a million dollars net worth, you're able to test to be accredited status. But I Again, I don't know why this even matters because 97 to 90% of deals out there, if you go to the SEC website and you, you look, you actually spend the time and go look through the Edgar database, 90 to 97% of those deals out there are for 506B deals, which include non-accredited investors, sophisticated investors. I don't know why people always fight to get into 506C deals. In my opinion, the reason why they're doing it is they can't raise the money from their list. That way they have to go to some crowdfunding website and they have to kind of throw a Hail Mary for investors. But that's just the way I look at it. Crowdfunding websites just cost too much to, obviously not for the investors, but for the operator. It just costs too much money to have money raised that way. I don't know why any good operator would use that. 
as a means to raising capital unless they're desperate. Average new apartment size shrinks in the East and West Coast cities, says the National RE Investor. So in buildings developed since 2010, apartments average rough size was 940 square feet. And that's down from an average size of a roughly 1,000 square feet in buildings created before 2010. They're saying prior to 2010, properties were more likely to feature a more prominent mix of two and three bedroom floor plans as opposed to studios and one bedrooms. And this kind of goes in hand in hand with like, like in Hawaii, they, there's a lot of multi-family households other people living under one roof. So if you guys have been keeping up with simplepassivecashflow.com content, I say that jokingly because it's almost impossible to do it, but these are the new articles that I created this month. And the first one is transitioning to syndications and LP tips webinar. That was a recent podcast and it's also in a webinar video form. So if you guys haven't checked out the Simple Passive Cashflow YouTube channel, go ahead and search for that. If you're listening to this on the podcast, just all be on video form for you to look at the cool pictures that I spent all my time searching for you guys. Make it worthwhile for me. Check it out on the YouTube channel. And so the next article here that I worked on was infinite banking with whole life insurance for 2020. When I have Chris Miles as a guest and he actually went through and showed a comparison of two policies, something that I know has never been done before, but I, I keep telling these guys, like my podcast listeners and my folks are super smart. Like you just can't keep bringing the same old lame stuff. It's boring. Uh, number three here, new investor portal with uh, three modules and the past deal webinars. So I launched the Simple Passive Cashflow members portal. It is free, but you only get the first three modules of the e-course. And you guys can do that by signing up for the newsletter or the investor club at simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. I also created this other 2020 goals launch, which after this meeting, we are going to stick around and we are going to go through this goals launch exercise together. And it uh, looks like we have a good amount of people, so we can definitely do a lot of, utilize these virtual breakout rooms to pair off and um, get some interaction within our tribe. So I'm kind of transitioning to my personal um, activities this past month. It gives uh, my investors a little insight into my life and maybe gives you some ideas and some things you guys to work on. I break them up into six categories and the first one is growth. So I spent a lot of December planning for 2020. I One of these ideas I had in my head was to finally do a multi-day mastermind in Hawaii. And we've done one in Sonoma before. And then last year we did one in Woodvineville, Washington near Seattle, but never in Hawaii because I had this living belief that nobody would fly out to Hawaii to see me. But apparently a lot of people will these days, or maybe it's just Hawaii, but you guys can check that out. Simplepassivecashflow.com slash Hui3, H-U-I-3 for details on that if you'd like to join us. But personally, I've implemented this new idea of Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. He gave a keynote speech at our last mastermind. And initially, it kind of sounds kind of obvious, almost elementary. Like, yeah, obviously, dummy. Like, you pay yourself first, right? You put money aside first. He brought this matrix here that I'm showing on the screen, but it, it shows where you are in terms of how much money you bring in. It says real revenue range, but that's more of like, instead of real revenue, I consider it more profit. So now let's just say you're bringing in zero to a quarter million dollars. Your profit that you should put aside as pure profit is 5%. So you should put like, you know, out of a hundred grand, five grand into the bank or make a different bank account. Like me personally, I'm going to put that in my wife's account and consider that gone. Hopefully that builds a little goodwill for me so I can keep investing. The next category is owner's pay. So this is where you pay yourself a salary for what you're doing. And it's different. It's a little different from profit, but very similar. So they're recommending here 50% to set aside as sort of your salary. And it's kind of going back to overview of this, like this is more for entrepreneurs, but I, I feel like all us real estate investors are sort of like entrepreneurs where the trouble is like, when do you take profits off the table and actually start living instead of putting your nose to the grindstone and keep saving and put more money into the next deal and the next deal and the next deal and the next deal. This gave me a little bit more framework. Uh, the next category is taxes. So it's it's 15% whether you make $0 or a gazillion dollars. Um, of course, 
course. Some investors making over $300,000 a year might say like, what the heck? That's 15%. But yeah, I see it all the time. You know, that's why you got to be investing. You got to get the deductions the, um, and then the bonus depreciation. That's how you get down to that 15% number. 2018, I paid 14%. And this past year, I paid 4% of taxes and uh, all following the rules. So if the IRS wants the auto, they can come and get it. You know, maybe they'll learn a thing or two, what I figure, or at least tell me how to do it the right way. Operating expenses. Now, this is something that I took away, like, and this is what I see as an investor, as the, you know, putting back into your business or buying more properties. So they're saying the less you make, the less you should be putting back into your business or investing. But for me, it was, I was doing so many things by myself in terms of running the investment side and running the education company and then going to the gym every day and stuff like that. I realized that my overhead was super low and I was working like 12 hour days. I mean, last night I was up to like three o'clock in the morning doing some of this stuff and that shouldn't be the case. And that's gonna probably gonna lead to burnout. So going through this profit first exercise, I realized that I need to allocate at least 30% to spending on things. Like I bought this drink. This drink is like a fortune. It's like five or six bucks. But as opposed to going to the store and buying all the vegetables to cold press it, I just buy it. At some point, time is more valuable than money. But if your net worth is under a quarter million dollars, I'm not talking to you, sir. You need to keep working and being a cheapskate, in my opinion. Second category here, contribution. I'm going to lead this goals seminar right after this. That's kind of my give back to the community I do every year. I've made it a lot better this year than last year. So there are some new things if you guys have done it in the past. But people like like to go through this exercise. It's a kind of a live experience. And we'll be doing this also in Hawaii. But uh, I've got a few other tricks up my sleeve to add to the content. But those of you guys who be sticking around, the whole thing is playful out and um, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Third category is significance. So closed a couple of deals late last year, the 104 unit in Huntsville and then the 212 unit in Reflections that I, I went and visited last time I was in Dallas last month and I played around with the golf cart. If you guys saw me on social media playing around with that, yeah, that's, that's why I do what I do because I can play around with the quote unquote other property is what that is called. Approach on higher level guests and others and authors on the podcast. So what I'm looking to do there is find things that you guys are interested in. So if like I'm having a more mindset person coming in, but not one of those foo-foo people and I'm definitely going to steer them in the right direction. But this is all simple passive cash flow. It shouldn't take very long to do all this stuff. And I, I keep telling a lot of people in the mastermind, if you're spending more than like five, six hours a month being a passive investor, you're doing it the wrong way. You need to figure out how to do it a lot more efficiently because you're doing it wrong. And I get it. Like if it's your first few months, you're going to be consuming podcasts left and right, but there's an easy way of doing it. And then there's a hard way of doing it. So if, it's, if there's any content out there that you want me to use the simple passive a casual podcast to get certain guests to ask our questions and let me know i'm always looking for feedback for the podcast to add more value out to you guys category four is uncertainty i'm trying to take some new mastermind groups and stop going to the normal real estate groupie ones out there which just usually has a bunch of newbies at it and what's been frustrating is i can't tell who are like legit people because everybody is wearing their nicest suit and it, it, everywhere you go, it looks like the NBA draft. So I've been trying some different mastermind groups outside of real estate and just and then traveling to new places, meeting different people. I will be out to Huntsville later this month. If you guys want to come and walk some properties with me out there, put that out to the mastermind group. I usually release my travel schedule. A number five certainty to hear, because you always want to have certainty in your life. You can't be all like, get out of your comfort zone nonsense all the time. So I went to Japan last week. I was in Japan and just ate a bunch of food. It's very comfortable there. And that's, uh, that's what I did for my, th my Christmas. Number six here, love and connection you know, schedule more meetings to this. I think yesterday I talked to like eight people throughout the day, but before the year gets moving and we, if we haven't talked before, let's uh, get on the phone and, and let's connect. Uh, simplepassacashflow.com slash talk before the year gets busy and I don't have time for that anymore. Get signed up for that. Some resistance, distraction, barriers, or noise that I've been dealing with. You know, with all the holidays, man, I can't seem to get anything done. Everybody just wants to have dinner, seems like. The holidays are over. Also, if you guys have any friends who are interested in Simple Passive Cashflow, getting that lifestyle, and you're tired of talking to them blue in the face, 
and they don't listen to podcasts and things, silly things like that, recommend the e-course and uh, connect us via email and then I'll pay you out a referral fee. Let me do the hard work and the educating and you can just have lunch with them five, 10 years from now when you're both retired. So other random things I bought, I bought this cold press juice subscription. I guess that's, I don't know, I guess that's considered something where it's super easy and maybe I, I should probably find something harder to do, but that's what I bought this month. Didn't really buy myself any Christmas presents, unfortunately, this year. But I've been reading this book, David Goggins. A lot of people talk about this guy. Some of my good buddies, they listen to this podcast. He's kind of crazy. He does ultra marathons and he went to Bud's like three times. If you listen to like the first chapter it's all about his childhood how he's abused and it's actually kind of graphic and i listen to it on my audiobook i don't read it's definitely shakes you up for sure here's a link out to that and i got all my other recommended books if you click this link in the show notes which is at simplepassivecashflow.com slash investor letter um and then the uh, the easter egg here is that the passive investor accelerator and mastermind is in year 2020 and if you guys are interested in that please go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash journey and if you're just interested in the e-course go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash course but maybe we have time for a couple of questions if you or any comments about some of the news we kind of went through earlier we can do that now or we can go right into the goals seminar about recession that you said in the beginning what could happen with a recession and the return on the syndication let's say that a recession of three years and what would change in the expected return? Well, I mean, I don't know specifically what deal you're talking about, but every deal is different, right? And that's why you can be investing in all types of things. For me, I go into investments that are producing cash flow today so that there's a little bit of buffer there, right? And I think a lot of people will have this mindset of, I'm not going to invest because everybody's saying it's the top of the market cycle. Right? But we don't know. It could go for another four years. Trump's likely going to get reelected and this, we could be on this part, drunken party for another four years. And you're going to miss out. You're going to be missing out because you listen to some random headline or some, there's a lot of fear-based articles and new, and new subscriptions out there. And I wouldn't get cash flow investing confused with fix and flipping real estate. It's all, fall, it's all considered real estate. And I think that's, to me, that's, that's the difference that I see. If it cash flows, that's, that's a big indicator that I look for. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.